right guys, how's it going? Welcome back. So should you buy a Range Rover L322? Oh, by the way, the L322 was just the code name given by Land Rover to this particular model Range Rover, which ran from 02 all the way to 2012, just in case you didn't know. If you've come this far and you're now watching Range Rover reviews online, you're obviously seriously considering one. But you're probably having second thoughts because your mate down the pub, well, his neighbor's cousin had one and he spent a fortune on it. It was the worst car he's ever owned. I think he had to sell one of his kids in the end just to get it through an MOT. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? How many times do we hear a story like that without any crucial facts? Or which model was it exactly? How was it maintained? What was the mileage? How old was it? Did it have any service history? How did your idiot cousin's neighbour actually drive it? These are all important factors. And that's the trouble with Range Rovers. Everybody has an opinion. Just because you had an old P38 once that blew its head gasket doesn't mean you shouldn't buy an L322. But anyway, the good news for you is I won't be giving a glass half empty Range Rover review. So let's get going. Which model should you buy then? Well, for less grief, you really want to buy the newest model you can afford. I'm not suggesting that the old ones are unreliable as such, but if you buy an O2 L322, it's now 17 years old, and you really might just be opening a can of worms. I think any old car has the age. You just end up chasing problems. From 2002 to 2005, you had two engine choices. They were both BMW units. So you could have a 4.4 litre V8 petrol, which produced 270 horsepower. By the way, all these figures are purely off the top of my head because I'm such a loser. I'm, I bet within a few digits I get them right. Anyway, so from 2002 to 2005, you had two engine options. They were both BMW units. You could either go for the 4.4 litre V8 petrol, which produced 270 odd horsepower, or the 3 litre TD V6, uh, TD6, not V6, just straight six, which produced 185 horsepower. But both these engines weren't without the problems. The old V8s had timing chain issues and Vanos issues. The TD6 was an old underpowered clattery old engine. So you're probably best avoiding the 02 to 05 Range Rover and go for something a little bit younger. In late 2005, they facelifted the L322. So you got new headlamps, new grille, new side vents, new rear lights, and also a host of new engines. You could have a 3.6 litre TD V8, a 4.2 litre supercharged V8 petrol, or a 4.4 litre Jaguar V8 petrol. Whichever of those engines you go for would be a better choice than the BMW engines, who were far more reliable. I suppose that the pick of the bunch was the 3.6 litre TD V8, because you got a V8 burble, you got the economy of a diesel, but the performance of a petrol. The Jaguar 4.4 was quite an underrated engine too. It produced 300 horsepower and it was quite a reliable old V8. In late 2009, they facelifted the L322 for one final time before introducing the L405 in 2013. And this really was the L322's swan song. And that brings me nicely on to today's car, because today I'm in a 2009 facelifted L322. And this one, wait for it, uses a 5 litre, 500 horsepower supercharged V8. <laughs> it's unbelievable, it's, it's magnificent this engine. So if I plant my right foot here, it's so powerful this car. Whoa, better slow down. It's so powerful this car. It's the same 5 litre supercharged V8 that you get in the XKR Jaguar in a Range Rover. It's absolutely ridiculous this car. You see this grin, I need to try and contain myself because if I'm not careful I'm going to come across as one of those American YouTubers and suddenly start making whooping noises for no reason. I promise I won't. This is my kind of car. You can keep your heart hatches. They do nothing for me at all. But stick a 500 horsepower V8 in a Range Rover and all of a sudden my ears prick up. A few months ago I did a video with a 2006 Range Rover 4.2 supercharged. Now watching it back I feel like a bit of a hypocrite because I just couldn't make my mind up with that car. One day I loved it, the next day I didn't. I don't know, I just couldn't make my mind up about it. The rest of the car I loved but the engine just had me conflicted. If I drive a car that only does 14 miles per gallon I want this cheesy grin on my face <laughs> every time I press the accelerator. And the old 4.2 did that occasionally, but not all the time. And this does it every time without fail. It's superb, it really is. This model is much more like it. The 5 litre has 100 horsepower more than the old 4.2, and you can really feel it. It has a 0 to 60 time of 5.9 seconds. I mean, 5.9 seconds from a Range Rover, it's, it's insane. I know what you're thinking. An 0 to 60 time in a Range Rover is pointless, it's irrelevant. And deep down I know you're right, but it all adds to its imperious nature. 
This 5 litre V8 is breathtaking, honestly. Yes, you might only average 15 miles per gallon, but it's, it's totally worth it. It sounds awesome. Have a listen to this. The interior is superb too. Although there's not as much rear legroom as you would expect. The windows are huge, so you can look down on people like Hyacinth Bouquet as you drive past. The seats are very comfortable. The quality of the leather on the steering wheel is excellent. This model gets heated and cooled perforated leather seats. Although that's fan assisted and when you turn it on, you do get quite a noise coming from the, um, the fan. But listen, that is the very definition of first world problems, isn't it? The fact that your ventilated seats and your supercharged Range Rover make a bit of a funny noise. So I wouldn't lose any sleep over that. Most of the time it's drowned out by the V8. The 09 model gets the digital dash, which brings the L322 bang up to date. I love the buttons on the steering wheel. You get heated steering wheel too, obviously. The interior of the autobiography L322 is so opulent and over the top, it's ridiculous. You even get this quilted leather headlining. The attention to detail is ridiculous. You know on the news from time to time when they depose a dictator, like Hussein or Gaddafi, and they show you their opulent palaces, and you think, that's a little bit sickly and over the top. The L322 autobiography is a little bit like that. With the autobiography model, the people at Land Rover have just looked at every single part and thought, how can we make that more flash? And that's exactly what they've done. I mean, I didn't know that I needed a leather headlining until today. You also, with the L322, get two visors, one for the side and one for the front. You get this lovely piano black trim, which just adds to its quality feel and feels more current than a mahogany dash or an oak trim. The other engine choice for the final L322 was a 4.4 litre turbo diesel V8, which produced over 300 horsepower. And that 4.4 litre TDV8 gives you more torque than a freight train. It's not as bonkers as this one, but you'll average 20 miles per gallon from that engine and 30 on a run. So it's very easy to live with. The ride from the L322 is superb. You can't feel any ripples in the road at all. It just completely irons them out. You're just so cocooned here in all this leather. It does a very good job of isolating the driver from the outside world. You drive this and you haven't got a care in the world. Because it's such a big car, parking it can be a bit of a chore. But you get a reverse camera, you get sensors on the front and rear. But it is a very wide car. You do get some body roll, obviously, with it being such a big, tall car. But it's nowhere near as bad as you'd think. The adaptive air suspension copes with the corners quite well. I've mentioned this before in other Range Rover videos, but you jump in a Range Rover, even a 10 year old one like this, and you just feel successful straight away. You just feel like you've made it. And I can't think of another car that does that quite so convincingly as a Range Rover. It just makes you feel like you've arrived. The level of quality on the interior, and trust me when I say this because I've had pretty much every other luxurious four wheel drive as well, it's in a different class. It's so much better than a Q7 or an X5. This engine is nuts, honestly. Oh, I love it. The L322 on the whole is starting to feel its age now. I don't mean this one in particular, but it's been around for 17 years. And the L405 that came out in 2012 has made this one feel a little bit old. Thanks to depreciation, you can now pick these up for around £16,000. And when you consider this car when it was new cost £86,000, that's £70,000 less or that's £70,000 that it's lost over its lifetime. When you jump inside, it still gives you that sense of occasion. It's majestic, really. In terms of reliability, this car's a bit of an oddity. It's had one owner from you, it's done 91,000 miles, and it's got full Land Rover service history. And it's had an extended warranty on it every single year of its life. That's an interesting point. I didn't know that you could do this, but if your car's got full Land Rover service records, you can buy an extended warranty for 12 months from Land Rover for around £1,500 which I know sounds like a lot of money, but it is a lot of money. But when you consider the cost of the parts of these things, they'll cover something like this that's 10 years old for £1,500 for 12 months. So I think that could be a wise choice. Then, of course, you can enjoy this car as you're supposed to without the worry of something breaking. It just completely takes away the worry of owning one of these. Realistically, I think I'm in the only Range Rover on the marketplace like this that's had one owner and been looked after to such a high standard. If you're looking for a facelift Range Rover L322 from 2009 or 2010, chances are it will have had several owners and it might have patchy service records. 
So here's what you need to look out for. If you buy the diesel, they have two EGR valves and you need to replace them at around 100,000 miles. So factor in about 800 pounds to do that job. Make sure the gearbox has had a service because they can break and you'll need to set aside around 2,000 pounds to replace it. The five litre V8 is infamous for a timing chain issue. I think the tensioners fail and the whole thing needs to be replaced. It's quite an expensive job, so if that hasn't been done, you need to factor in a couple of grand to get that done. All the more reason to take out an extended Land Rover warranty. But the risk of sounding like an optimist, if you buy a 10 year old one, the chances are it's probably had it done. Just make sure it idles right with no misfires. Make sure you've not got an engine warning light on. Range Rovers have air suspension and the compressor, which is in the spare wheel well, can fail. Now that's not the end of the world because you can buy used parts for a reconditioned compressor for around £300 off eBay or somewhere like that. And it's quite a straightforward job to replace. So that shouldn't put you off buying one. The air struts as well can fail, which is why sometimes you see a Range Rover completely on its backside like it's been lowered. Now they cost around three or four hundred pounds per corner. It's rare that you have to replace all four, it's usually just one or two that fail. <clears throat> but if you do, set aside four hundred pounds a corner for that. By now you're probably adding all this up in your head thinking, you know what, I'm going to steer well clear. But you'd be missing out because they are a superb car. Other than the cost of the parts that I've just mentioned, you've got standard things like tyres and brakes. But they're no more expensive than a Q7 or an X5, so that shouldn't break the bank really. It's just part and parcel of owning a big heavy car. So they do cost more to run than a Ford Fiesta, but that goes without saying. I still think they're a bargain because it's lost £70,000, which means you're getting an £86,000 car for a fraction of its original cost. It's a very capable car on and off road and it will put a smile on your face. So I think when you get your MasterCard out to pay for a service on it, I just think the positives outweigh the negatives. If you want power and luxury, it does cost, but in my opinion, that's a price worth paying. I realise though that I might be a little bit out of touch because I buy and sell cars and my weekly repair bills are ridiculous. So I've just got used to the fact that cars break. So when something breaks, I just get it fixed. I said this before on I think my Land Cruiser video and I got some stick for it. But what I said was, in my opinion, there's no brand that's better or worse than any others. They're all as bad as one another. I can sell a French car and have no issues with it, no warranty claims. Then I can sell a Japanese car and the turbo fails and it costs me an engine. So that's just used cars for you, they break. So you may as well buy the car you want and just repair it when it breaks. That's literally all the advice I can give. It really comes down to how it's been looked after, how it's been maintained and how it's been driven. That sounds so good, it just pins you into your seat. So thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. If you've got any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Cheers guys, see you next time.